Turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm not going to read the passage at large. I will begin with just a couple verses, then I will deal with a few others. But I want to ask you this morning, you know, relax. Take a deep breath. We'll be here for just a little bit. Plan on eating together today, God willing. And I have something for you this morning. The question is, I pray God has something for you this morning. You know, it, when you, at least to some degree, when you realize what you are by nature, and then you realize you have to stand and publicly speak to men and women about their corruption and the absolute holiness of God, it makes you feel not even that tall. Because it is. Who is sufficient for these things? And even the Apostle Paul, that's his words. Yes, sir. I have a little bit of an idea what he meant. And Mason, that man had the care of all the churches. Yes, sir. The only care I really have, I'm talking about that responsibility, is this little small group right here. And whenever you do this, you know, because we have people come in here and it doesn't matter who it was. It doesn't matter. But boy, Walter's cocky. And you know, yeah, they're right. They're right. But then somebody else comes along, comes in, says, well, Walter needs to quit apologizing for himself. <laughs> and it's like, you know, so what, you, you can't make everybody happy all the time. If you are, you're lying to them. Yeah. And you're lying to yourself. But one thing is true. As Joe and I stand here, we are not preaching ourselves. But ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, we're preaching him. And that's what people really don't like. If we stood up and preached about us and how we used to be a sinner and now we've straightened up our life and we serve the Lord, <coughs> we'd be far more accepted in society today. But because we tell men and women what they truly are by nature, and we continue to keep hammering on it, and hammering on it, and hammering on it, and then say the only answer to your problem, which is you, you are your problem, yeah. the only answer to your problem is Jesus Christ. They hate that more than anything in this, else in this world. They don't even mind election as long as you tell them God chose you because of something you would do. Exactly. Right. Huh? If you give man the credit, they don't mind any doctrine of Scripture. You're right. So then, let's look at 1 Peter for a moment. Chapter 1, I will read, because to give you what I want to try to do this morning is found in these two verses. 2 Peter, did I say 1 Peter? If I did, 2 Peter, I'm sorry. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Wherefore, so that lets us know he's continuing here with his, with his train of thought. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, Though ye know them. Amen. And be established in the present truth. In other words, he's saying it doesn't matter that you already know this and you're established in it. I'm going to keep hammering on it and hammering on it and hammering on it. Yes, sir. So-called Christianity today despises that. Yeah. It's what Tim James called that resplendent redundancy. Yeah. Just line upon line upon line. God's people love it. But the unregenerate hate it. It's boring. It drives them mad. You just keep saying the same things over and over and over. That's right, because we're saying it over and over. Per adventure, God will give somebody repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Amen. There is nothing deeper to go to other than the personal work of Jesus Christ. That's right. Prophecy, future events, they don't cut it compared to the personal work of Jesus Christ. That's right. Because whatever is still prophecy, whatever is, God Almighty and the person of His Son is in sovereign control of all of it. Amen. Now, wherefore, I will be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, it is proper. I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. In other words, I'm going to do this till the day I die. Yeah. Isn't that what Peter's saying? It ain't going to change. You know, there are people who've been here, left, got upset. They think, they come back and they think, well, maybe things will be different. It'll be just like it always was. 
We're still the same old sinners. Exactly. We've not got any more holy. No, that's true. Jesus Christ hadn't stepped down off the throne one iota. Amen. So it's still all the same. Yes, sir. <laughs> still all the same. Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in, uh, in this, as I am in this tabernacle. And then he says, to stir you up. Yes. Now, if a man claims to be sent to preach the gospel and he's not trying to stir you up, he ain't sent to preach the gospel. There you go. If he's just trying to make you feel good, mm -hmm. just trying to make you feel comfortable with yourself, he's a liar. He's not called of God. To stir you up by putting you, by putting you in remembrance. I want to keep hammering on these things and just keep putting it before you and putting it before you. It's what some of the old writers used to call pressing upon men and women the claims of Christ. Amen. I like that phrase. I like that phrase. Now, inspiration declares, and I say that, not just out of left field. You'll see it here. Inspiration declares that it is meet, it's proper to be reminded of some things. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. And inspiration declares it because you'll look at what Peter goes on to say in just a moment, what he goes on to write. He said, I had this marvelous experience on the top of this mountain. Yeah. You remember the account? Oh, yeah. Peter, James, and John, Christ took them up into that mountain. And they seen things that no other individuals, other than maybe Paul, when he was caught up into the third heaven, no other individuals have ever seen. Yes, sir. And yet, Peter says, we got a more sure word of prophecy than that. Amen. Exactly. Even that glorious experience means nothing compared to what? This right here. Amen. God Almighty's inspired word. Exactly. This, if it's not taught here, and under the auspices of the new covenant. So that's why a lot of they read the Bible and say, I'm confused. So they don't realize there was an old covenant. It's done away. Now we're under the new covenant. Yes, sir. That's right. And the fact that the new covenant is officiated and brought into pass and, 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 and relegated all by the person of Jesus Christ, that's why they don't want to have anything to do with it. Because he's in charge of it all. Amen. Inspiration declares that it is meat, it's proper. Why? Because Peter wrote it down, being moved by God to say this. Exactly. I'm sure Peter said a lot of things in his life that weren't inspired of God. But when he wrote this epistle, Mason, it is God Almighty's mind opened up, yes, sir. at least in language, opened up for us. Amen. To be put in remembrance of God's great truth. And you're right, Joe. A lot of things are true, but there's only one truth. Amen. A lot of things may be true. The law is true, but the law is not the truth. That's right. <laughs> you know that? Exactly. The law is true, but it's not the truth. John said so. Yeah. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. The law is true. It's holy, it's just, it's good. But it's not truth. Amen. Somebody says, I don't understand that. I'm sad. Yeah. I'm sad that you don't. Shows a lot. Says a lot about you. <laughs> to be put in remembrance of God's great truth ushers in, according to Peter, being inspired now, never forget that. According to Peter, it ushers in spiritual stability and assurance. Now look at verse 10. Wherefore? So we realize he's still going on about a, this is a previous statement he made to what I just read, but he's going on from something else. Wherefore the rather brethren, rather than being like the man in the previous two or three verses, yeah. wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. So that means pay some attention to this. Yes, sir. Pay some attention. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now let me say this. There's nothing you can do to get yourself called or elected. Amen. Peter is not saying, now go out here and do something, and that way, that way you can make sure you're called and elected. That's not what he's talking about. God Almighty calls men at his sovereign pleasure at his sovereign time. Peter's saying, you better check and find out if what happened to you is really what happens to those God saves. Exactly. Look back and see what happened in your life and see if it was real 
if it was of God. Now, I have not and will not, will try not to use the word here, experience. Yeah. I'm talking about what God Almighty right. does to an individual when he saves them. Now, experience is not a bad word, but here's the problem with experience. A lot of people have had experiences and don't don't ever don't ever say well you didn't have an experience yeah they had an experience but it's an experience of satan it's an experience of error it's an experience of life they can even have a wrong experience under gospel preaching simon the sorcerer did that's exactly right he believed in so much he seemed so real that philip baptized him yeah and then when peter comes along he showed what he really was there you go you see it you see what I'm saying? So I'm not just talking about them out there. I'm talking about right here, even here. Don't think because you come here, you automatically have a lock on God's truth. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Look at it. But here's what. Make your calling and action short for you. If you do these things, be constantly mindful of this. Did God really call me? Because the only way I can know if I'm chosen is if God called me. There you go. Nobody can know their elect until God calls them. Well, I think I'm one of the elect. I, I got a little concern. A lot of people had concern. That's exactly right. A lot of people had concern. Every one of those people that said, Lord, Lord, yeah. had concern. The man that built his house on the sand, he had concern. Yes, he did. But he was on the wrong foundation. Yeah. And what happened to his house? The fall of it was great. If you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see it? That's what I said. To be put in remembrance of God's great truth ushers in spiritual stability and assurance. Yes, sir. This morning, what I want to try to talk about, what I want to try to do is to put you in remembrance. When I say you, I mean myself as well. Yes, sir. Let's concentrate on Peter's first amazing thought with the idea of remembrance. Look at what he says. This is amazing. Chapter 1, 2 Peter, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And let's just, that, that's, there's, I could preach probably for months upon that. But that's not the point I want to remind you about. You know that part. But you know the other part too. But remember, I'm going to put you in remembrance even though you know it and established it. Right. But I'm getting tired of hearing it, preacher. Then go somewhere else. Yeah. That's just it. Yeah. Go somewhere else. Yeah. Go, you'll find a place that will preach to you what you want to hear. Oh, yeah. I'm preaching to you what I know you need to hear. Mm -hmm. Because God Almighty sent me. And if that's cockiness, what? but it ain't about me. God Almighty sent me. I know that. Yeah. Now look. To them. Here's the amazing. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. If you got faith by your free will, you don't have this kind of faith Simon Peter's talking about. You're right. I'm not going to sit and argue with me if free will real or not. If your experience is your free will brought you faith and you believe in Jesus but by your free will, you don't have this kind of faith. Because this kind of faith is obtained how? Through the righteousness of God, not through free will. Amen. What it says it. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The fact that I have a God-given faith this morning is because God Almighty did right. Amen. Yeah. That's because God Almighty did right. And he did right through the person and work of his son. Amen. Hmm. Somebody says, boy, that's a bold statement to make about yourself. I'm not making that statement about myself. I'm making that statement about God. Amen. <laughs> See, you don't get it. You still haven't understood. You still haven't heard if you think I'm talking or bragging or having merit to myself. Yeah, you're right. Mm -mm. Yeah. I want to put us in remembrance. Note the wording. It doesn't say to them who, who have obtained 
like precious righteousness yeah. through the gift of faith. Although we could say that's true. But that's not what Peter says. That's not what he's talking about. So you see what I'm pointing out here? If you have faith, this faith, you obtained it by a righteous act of God. Amen. And through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. That's it. <laughs> that's the only way you'll ever obtain this kind of faith. This like right. precious faith. Not just any old kind of faith. Yeah. Remember those people that knocked. They had faith, Joe. Oh, yeah. They had faith, but they had faith in themselves. Yeah. Exactly. They had faith in themselves. Have we not? <laughs> Have we not? They expected to enter in because of what they did. Exactly. Not because of a righteous act of God. Right. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So again, I want to put you, put us in remembrance. So let's concentrate on this. For just a moment. May God, may God enable us this morning to remember. Yes, sir. Remember. And I will give you this, kind of probably sum it up the, the message up this way. You realize that you can you cannot go back to a place you've never been. That's right. It's just a, a human impossibility. You cannot go back to a place you ever you never been. You cannot remember something that never happened to you. Exactly. So, oh, God, help us to be honest with our souls this morning. And I'm not going to give you my experience because my experience don't mean squat. I'm going to give us what men and women experienced in this book when God Almighty moved upon them in free, sovereign, saving grace. And I must ask myself, I, you should ask yourself, does my calling fit that? There you go. That's it. Because if it doesn't, I don't care what kind of calling you had, what kind of experience you had, it was not of God. That's it. Do you understand what I'm saying? you understand what I'm saying? First of all, and I'm not going, this, this is just prelude, I'm still on the introduction. First of all, when it has it, it's obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. One, we have obtained like precious faith with them through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ because of God's sovereign purpose. Go back sometime and look at Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 6. Amen. God predestinated a people and chose that people. Yes, sir. And God was right in carrying out that purpose. Amen. He goes on to say even believing, having heard the word, even believing is included in that purpose. Right? Yes. So Mason, when somebody believes, having been predestinated and chosen, it's because of the righteousness of God. God is doing right in fulfilling his sovereign predestinating will. Amen. Secondly, we've obtained like precious faith with them. That's with the, the apostle, others who have this truly this true like precious faith. We've obtained this like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ by Christ's substitutionary sacrifice in our place. Romans 8 verse 32. He that delivered him up for us all. And go look at the passage. The us all are a particular people. Amen. Go look at it. It's what it says. He that delivered him up for us all. If he died for me. Yeah. How shall God not with him also freely give us all things? Is faith necessary? Absolutely. Yeah. Where does it come through? It comes by a righteous act of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Is repentance necessary? Now we're talking about faith, but is repentance? Absolutely. But how's that come? God grants it based upon the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Amen. Yeah, that's, right. that's what Romans 8 verse 32 sums it up clearly. If Christ died for you, God's going to give you everything else you need. Amen. And if Christ didn't die for you, he'll leave you right where you are, and you'll get your just reward in hell. Yep, that's exactly right. And God will have offended you, not one iota. Amen. But if he saves you, it'll be all free, absolute, sovereign grace. Thirdly, we've obtained like precious faith with them. That's with Peter, with these others in scriptures, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, through the creative act of the Spirit in regeneration and the power of the Spirit, attending gospel preaching. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. Where Paul said to the Thessalonians, I'm bound. That, that, that's, that's a duty thing. 
Yes, sir. That's a, you know, the truth is such that I'm bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and that always must come first. Amen. And belief of the truth, and that always must be. Amen. You don't believe lies. You believe free will religion. You're believing the lie. You'll perish. You're right. You're right. Through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God, make us remember, but remember the facts. Remember the facts. Don't, oh, God help you. Don't deceive yourself. You hear me, any of you? I'm looking you in the eyes. Don't deceive yourselves. Amen. And if I could look myself, don't deceive yourself. Don't say, when I give you these things, well, I'm close to that. But it really don't matter. After all, I'm a chapel. I'm under sovereign grace preaching. That's not a solid foundation, folks. No, it's not. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Oh, God, make us to remember and remember what? Properly. Amen. Remember the facts. You know, sometimes the Spirit reveals things to men, but unless He regenerates them, they'll see some truth. Mm -hmm. but, but if they're unregenerate, they will rebel against that truth and twist that truth to fit their own experience rather than bowing down and saying, my experience don't meet that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I hope you see what I'm saying. So then, let us remember that what happened to God's people recorded in Scripture, and that's the standard, right? I mean, in other words, those yeah. that this book says God saved, I want to know how did he save them, right? Yeah. Now, I've given you the foundation of it in the first three points. But now I'm talking about what happens to you when God Almighty exactly. lays hold of a man or a woman. You understand what I'm, where I'm coming from now? Yes, sir. Let us remember that what happened to God's people recorded in Scripture, this has come upon us also with them. With yes, them. Obtained like precious faith with us. Mm. So Peter's saying, I'm no better than you are. Exactly. Right? You're no better than I am. Amen. And people don't get to, oh, well, so-and-so don't love me enough. You're not lovable. There you go. That's it. You're not lovable. You're right. The love of God's people is in Christ. Amen. We love what God has done for other people because he's done for us the same thing he has for them. Amen. And we can relate to that and to them. Yes, sir. And they still know they're a sinner. Amen. And every time they point their finger at somebody else, eventually God will smite their heart and realize, oh, what a hypocrite I am. Well, I'm not treated right. You don't deserve to be treated right. Get off your high horse of pride and may God shove your face in the dust and realize it's not me you got to meet up to. It's not Joe you got to meet up to. It's the holy, thrice holy God of heaven and earth. He's the one before whom you'll stand or fall. Yes, sir. Quit worrying about other sinners. Yes, sir. Quit worrying about what they think about you. You best be concerned what God thinks about you. Hmm. Help me, God. Help me to remember. Two aspects to remember. First of all, God has wrought upon us. That's what I'm saying. God has wrought upon us. Now, you can turn to it if you wish. I'm not going to read it. But you go back to John chapter 16. If you want, I'll make a few statements if you wish to turn there. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 14 in particular. Our Lord Jesus Christ said this. The spirit of, the spirit of truth must come. Yes, sir. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And unless that happens to you, you are not saved. There you go. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and argue with that. It's just the way it is. 
That's God's ordained way. He will reprove. The, he will reprove. Not try to reprove. Exactly. Not make reproof yeah. possible. Not give them a good nudge and then they finish it up. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Amen. Remember? Remember when God convinced you of your unbelief? Do you remember that? Now, if you say to yourself, well, I've always believed, Walter, then you don't know. You've not been wrought upon. Well, I've always believed. No, you haven't. <laughs> See, the first thing the Spirit of God does when he works upon a man or a woman is convince them that they are in unbelief. Exactly. Right. I brought up on the truth. I believed this since I was born. You believed up here. You might even believed here, but you haven't believed by an act of the righteous God. Because God Almighty sent himself in the person of the Spirit. Yep. So I'd say he sent even Christ, because he's called the Spirit of Christ. Yes, sir. Spirit of Christ that's in you. Sent his Spirit himself into this world to convince us of the first day is what? Our unbelief. You're right. Amen. Our unbelief. To convince them of sin. What's my main sin? What's my main problem? Unbelief. Amen. If I believed God as God deserved to be believed and as I ought to believe, I would never sin again. Exactly. But I can't. I'm still reproved of unbelief today. Yes, sir. Today. Yeah. Remember when God convinced you of your absolute lack of righteousness? <clears throat> you ever been convinced of your absolute lack? Not just you have some unrighteousness. What did he say? Convinced the word of righteousness. Why? Because I go to the Father and you see me no more. He is the only source of absolute righteousness. And when you don't see him, you don't see any absolute righteousness. Exactly. That lets me know that when I see me, what am I seeing, Joe? That even my righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight. Amen. You remember when God convinced you? That God must judge everything that's fallen. Hmm? Yes, sir. Of sin, of righteousness, and what's the third one? Of judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world is judged. Isn't that, have you ever thought of that's an odd statement? Yeah. But it's not that odd when you quit trying to find the great deep meaning. Yeah. When you're looking for that great spasm of religious enlightenment. The first sin, God condemned it. That's right. At least the first sin that's ever mentioned in Scripture that we know about. And that was whose sin? Yeah. Lucifer's. Yeah. Yeah. Lucifer's. And God cast him out of heaven. And Christ said, I beheld him as lightning falling from heaven. Exactly. And if God will judge him, you think God won't judge me? Right. Hmm? That's exactly right. Neil, he was created in absolute holiness. He was a perfect angel. But pride. And we're not even told how it goes. We don't know. It doesn't matter. God said, I seen pride in you. God cast him down. Huh? Don't think God Almighty won't judge you. Don't think, oh, but I'm not that bad. Yeah, you're that bad. You're that bad. You deserve to go to hell a million times. I deserve to go to hell a million times. And I deserve to have God mock when it happens. You're right. Yep. Because he called. And what do we do by nature? Mm -hmm. We refuse. Exactly. We refuse. Yep. Every person that's ever even read this Bible or had this Bible read to them has had a call from God. They've had the truth of God read to them. And men say, I will not respond. I will not follow. I will not obey. You know what God said? Hey, go back. It's in Proverbs. God said, I will mock. That's what God, this is who God is, folks. I'm not trying to ease God into your left pocket. And maybe you might reach in one day and pull him out. He's so sweet and lovable. He said, when your calamity comes, I will mock. 
That's God. Amen. Quit playing games. Don't listen to these liars out here. God is a God of judgment. Amen. And everybody God saves, he convinces them of that. Yes, Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Right there's three sound pillars to remember. Yes, sir. Have you been there? Can you remember that? Hmm. Here's number two. God wrought this work upon us <clears throat> by the gospel. Yes, sir. By the gospel. A lot of people's had a lot of experiences. But there's very few people, even in our country today, that really have heard the gospel. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Now, I believe at one time in this country, the gospel was preached far more than it is today. But be that as it may, that's God's business too. Exactly. That's God's business too. But the fact is today, most people think that we're just like everybody else. We're not like everybody else. And who made us to differ? Not ourselves. Exactly. God did. Amen. God did. We're different because God Almighty did something different to us than what everybody else has experienced out here in this world. And that ain't bragging on us. That's bragging on God. Amen. Remember, God's fulfilled. He's doing righteous in fulfilling his sovereign purpose. He is doing righteous in giving us what we need based upon the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And he is through an act of life, giving us life within our souls. And he brings that which brings that life to light. That light Life and immortality is brought to light through that gospel. And that person with life says, I believe that Christ. Amen. And it happens that way for all of them. Amen. All of them. <laughs> Paul didn't tell Titus we're saved by regeneration. Did you know that? You're right. He said we're saved by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. And the only way you're going to know you're ever regenerated is if he renews you. That's the way you'll know. Because when he renews you, that's when you, the gospel lays hold of you and conquers your soul. Yes, sir. You remember the goads? You remember? And it, I'm not asking you to remember a day, a, a time. That's not what I mean. You remember the goads. And when we're talking about goads, remember that's what our Lord told Saul of Tarsus. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And this, I talk about a little prick. Talk about a goad. Goad. Actually, it has to do with the soul sting of poison. Yeah. It's talking about like a bite from a poisonous snake. Yeah. You see, when God Almighty goads you, He's going to cause you to see how poison you really are. You're right. <laughs> That's what He did to Saul of Tarsus, didn't He? What He did to Saul of Tarsus. Remember the goad? Do you remember the gospel sent message? Do you remember it? I'm not talking about this one. I'm, I'm not trying to say, oh, I heard this. But I'm, Do you remember that the gospel preached? I don't care whether it was in written form and you was reading a message by a man that's been dead for 200 years or you was hearing it on a cassette tape or you heard it from a man standing behind a podium. But I'm saying, do you remember when the gospel began to conquer your soul and you couldn't get away from it? There you go. You found yourself believing it even in spite of yourself. Amen. You remember that? And let me tell you, God has a way of doing it. You look through the book of Acts, but I'm just going to give you a few. You look through, I'm not going to go back and touch on it. Acts chapter 8, verse 35, Cornelius is praying. Now, God had done something for Cornelius. Yeah. Yes, sir. And he's praying, and he's praying, and he's asking God for something. And what was he asking for? I need to know who the Messiah is. Because when he recounted it to Peter, he said, the angel told me my prayer is answered, it's heard. So what then happened? God sent Peter to him to preach Christ to him. But here's the amazing thing. He'd already sent him an angel. Why didn't the angel go ahead and tell him? He said your prayer's heard, send for Peter. Why didn't the angel go ahead and tell him? Was he not able? He could have been able. He could have, he could have told who the Christ was. He was... He was Christ's servant. There you go. That angel was, was he not? Yes, sir. No, because it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. And preaching happens this way. God will send a sinner to preach to you as a sinner that you need to bow to Christ. Amen. And there are men and women who hate that. I will not listen to him. Who does he think he is? It don't matter. 
God sent him, you better listen. And when God lays hold of you, you will. <laughs> you will. He said, send for Peter. Right? Sin for Peter. What about Saul of Tarsus? He met Christ personally on the road to Damascus. Lord, what would thou have me to do? Well, why didn't Jesus just tell him? Yeah, there you go. Huh? Think about it. Why didn't Jesus just tell him right there? What did he do? No, you go down there and you wait. You go down there and you wait. I'm going to send a man to you. That's right. And he'll tell you what you should do. Isn't that amazing? Yes, sir. Isn't that amazing? What That's amazing. Why? Because it pleased God to do yeah, that man. way. It ain't because God had to do it that way. It pleased God to do it that way. Yes, sir. Hmm. Go look at Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 14. God opened Lydia's heart. There you go. And God must do it. I can't do that for you. My preaching itself won't do that for you. God must open the heart. Right. But when he does, what will it be in lieu of? Yeah. What will it will be because of? Because there's a messenger there with a message your heart needs to hear. And it says he opened her heart that she attended unto the things which were spoken by what? Paul. That's right. Paul. You mock God's ordained means, you mock God, not the means. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? You remember though? I remember. I remember God sending a man called Joe Galusic. And Joe wasn't just Joe. And he'd give me a tape here. He'd give me a message by Spurgeon here or there. And Mac, I'd read these things. And my heart was smoked within me. I couldn't get away from the truth of who these men were preaching. There you go. Couldn't get away from it. As according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this gospel breaks down all the citadels that we have raised up against God and it knocks them down and crumbles it all into proud dust before us. Exactly. And it brings every thought into what? Obedience to Christ. Amen. To Christ. Yeah. Do you remember? This is an amazing one. I want you. To, I want to read this one. I'll try to move. turn to Galatians chapter three. I've seen this for years, but just it, just it don't, that don't matter. Here's the third one. Do you remember Christ's crucifixion being made real to you, as if it happened right in front of you? Huh? Now listen to me. Don't play off what I'm saying here because I'm going to give you what God says. Do you remember? Do you remember Christ's crucifixion being made real to you as though it happened right in front of you? Look at what Paul told the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. Now granted, he is using it. He's, he's rebuking them here. I'm saying, do you remember this? Look at it. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Look, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified for you. Uh -uh. Among you. Amen. Do you see it? Yeah, that's right. You don't just believe the death of Christ as a historical fact. It becomes a reality to you. Sir. It affects the very way you think, the very way you pray, the very way you walk. It affects everything about you, and you can't get away. Jesus Christ was crucified right there. Yes, sir. And I seen him hanging there for my sin, exactly. crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me when it should have been me on that cross? There you go. Yeah. Me! Right. And I should have died that miserable, torturous death. And then read, I should have went to hell. Yeah. But he suffered that for me. Is the gospel that real to you? Or is it just a doctrine you believed? Remember? Remember? Remember gospel truth turning you against yourself? There's another good one. Turn to Job now. Where is Job? It's right before Psalms, isn't it? Job chapter 9. I, I, I like this. Because, you know why? Because I can remember this. 
<laughs> I can remember this. Job chapter 9. <laughs> I'll give you time. I want you, to, I want you to read it. Read it. Job chapter 9. Look at verse 20. Look at it. Are you there? Job 9 verse 20. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. You remember that? I remember that not just 30 some years ago. That happened to me yesterday. <laughs> it still happened. It happened to me this morning. The wife says, you should have done this. And uh, even if I don't say it out loud, I'm grumbling under my table. Well, it wasn't that bad. Huh? You ever done that? You ever tried to justify yourself? Oh, yeah. It might work before me. Yeah. You might be a better man or a better woman than me, but I'm not your standard. Exactly. <laughs> Think about that. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. <laughs> you remember? Do you remember? I still remember that today. Today, wait a minute, we're not done yet. Look at one more. Let me get the right one. Verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, that is, cleaner than they've ever been before, yeah. make them never so clean. Now look at it. Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and my own clothes shall abhor me. Amen. God, you remember God bringing you to realize you're dirtier than even your clothes are? Huh? Right. And he's not talking just about physical filth. You see the metaphor that Job's getting here? I am unclean. Exactly. So unclean that my clothes are better before God than I am. Exactly. My clothes. Oh, do you remember? Well, I, I, I've never been there, preacher. And God hadn't saved you yet. Oh, it may he begin to cause you to experience these things. I, I say this. Maybe this is one of them places where I'm supposed to not apologize for myself. People misunderstand us all the time. And sometimes because we state things wrongly. But most of the time they misunderstand because they say, I will not listen to another man. Mark it down. You remember Job's three friends? Oh yeah. And all they did was just, just make it worse for him. Exactly. But then God sent what? A fourth man. That's right. A younger man than even the other three. Yes, sir. Now, boy, isn't that insult add an insult to injury? Huh? Yeah. Younger than Job, younger than his three friends. And he said, I kept my mouth quiet. Y'all fellas older than I. But basically, y'all said enough. Now, here, I'm going to tell you the truth. There you go. You remember that? Yep. See, even then, Mason, God was still using one sinner to talk to another sinner about what the truth of God is. Amen. Isn't he? See, if you, you say, well, I read this book and God opened up Christ to me. You're reading what sinners wrote. That's exactly. Don't you get that? Yeah. Sinners wrote this book. Did they not? That's right. But they wrote this book being moved of the Spirit of God. Amen. What I say is fallible. What they wrote is infallible. Amen. That's right. Infallible. Do you remember that this wasn't a one-time event? All of these things I'm talking about, it still happens over. You know, I heard Tim James say this one time in my pride. So I, I don't like that. Tim said, I, God saved me every time I heard the gospel. I like that. When I first heard it, I thought, well, yeah. well, come on now. Every time I hear the gospel, God saves me. He enlivens my soul. He encourages me. He lifts me up. And if he doesn't use something's wrong with you. Exactly. You hear me? Yeah. It ain't Walter. It ain't Joe. It ain't any of these other preachers we have come in here. Yeah. No, sir. It's you. And at best, at best, it's complacency. Yeah. We've been in the way so long and been so used to it so long. Yeah. Oh, God deliver us from what? Complacency. Yeah. Right. Oh, God help me to remember. I remember how, what a joy. When I began to see these things, Mason, and it wasn't a one time all like that. I began to see a few things that God would bring me down. Then I'd hear another message over here by Henry Mahan and God would bring me down. And things be until finally it was like, God, I give up. 
I can't win. Yeah. And you finally get to that place where you don't want to win anymore. You you know? It's all right. Lord, put the boot on my neck. Yeah. I'll be your slave. There you go. Ever been there? Yeah. Paul said, I'm a what? A bond servant. That means a slave. Amen. But a slave who wants to be one. Amen. That's the difference. Yes, a slave, I don't like that language. That's tough. That's scriptural language. Yes, sir. That's God's word. You will be the slave of Jesus Christ willingly or you will perish. Amen. Or you will perish. He'll put his boot on your neck and conquer you. Or he'll just let you go your way on to hell. He don't even have to do anything to you. Exactly. But he might do something to you along the way. Yeah, you know. hmm? It says he hardens whom he will. Amen. It says God sends some people strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all might be damned. Amen. Does it say that or not? Yeah. It says that, don't it? Yeah. Do not play games with God. But you're just a man. That's right, but that's the way God's ordained it. And if you hear from God, you'll hear from God through another fallen man. You can't even bypass me. Just go to this book. Remember, who wrote this book? Yeah. Sinners. <laughs> Sinners! Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. But you know what, Joe? There's some comfort there. Mm -hmm. Because I can remember that. Yeah. That happened to me. And let me tell you, that is still happening to me. Here's Here's Paul the Apostle. I don't know. I, I could have researched it. I didn't. It don't matter. But he'd have probably been apostling for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the right word? Apostling for a while. He's writing down an epistle, a letter to the church at Rome. And he's being moved to the Spirit of God to do it. And he gets to what we now have as divided up as chapter 7. And he gets to this place where he says, I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. Amen. And his inner corruption. He wasn't talking about any particular sins, was he? No, he, he talked about this inner corruption, exactly. this inability. I have the will to do, but not the power, the ability. But what does he say? He cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. If you ever get over that. God Almighty has never done this to you. you well, once God Almighty sends his spirit and begins to convince you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he will do it till the day you die. Right. Till the day you die. If it ever quits, it wasn't the spirit of God doing it. There you go. It was maybe the preacher's influence, maybe family's influence, uh, mama's influence, daddy's influence, somebody's influence. But it wasn't through the power of the Spirit of God. Because why do I know that? Paul said, he that hath begun a good work in you, how long are you going to do that? Yeah. He will do it until Jesus Christ comes again. That's not a verbatim, but that's what he's talking about. Yes, He'll perform it until the day of <laughs> Jesus Christ. You see, it is impossible to forget that which happens to you every day. That's right. Yeah. I mean, when it happens to you every day, every day God brings me down. Yep. Every day I drive to work and I ain't done nothing wrong yet, Joe. Drink some coffee, eat a little cereal, and driving to work. And I feel so unclean and undone. And I've got that gospel message on. And I'm listening to it. And all of a sudden I hear the truth of Christ and it lifts me up. Yes, sir. Huh? while I'm still flat faced in the dirt. Do you understand what I'm getting? I'm not talking about I come up and I'm so great. No, I'm still right there in the dust. But I realize if my Lord died for me, it's all okay. Isn't it? It's all okay. So it's impossible to forget that which happens to you every day. Do you remember? As I said, no one can go back to where they've never been. But no one can forget when they deal with the same need and the same hope every day. Every day. You know, that's pretty simple, but that's profound, is it not? Yes, sir. Think about it. No one can forget when they deal with the same need and the same hope every day. If you ever get past that, you're in trouble. There you go. If you ain't never been there, you're in trouble. Yeah. If you're there, remember. <laughs> you hear me, brothers? Hear me, sisters, remember. Father, as we continue 
<laughs> as we eat together and fellowship together. Oh, God, comfort us in Christ. Lord, reprove us. We need reproving. Lord, make us glad for it. In Christ's name, amen.